Hello everyone and welcome back to another video on building out your canvas course shell. So once again with me is my handy dandy partner in crime, Michael Hill. Say hello, Michael. Hello, Michael. <laughs> and as always, our fabulous guinea pig extraordinaire, Dr. Lynn Larson. Hello, Dr. Larson. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> So my friends, today we're going to be building out a threaded discussion, an asynchronous online conversation. So there's a couple different ways you can do this and Michael's gonna walk you through both permutations so that as we've been showing you, there's no such thing as only one right way and you need to be mindful of not just what you're building, but how you choose to do it. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to indeed my partner in crime. Michael, it's all yours. Absolutely fabulous. Okay, so Dr. Larson, let's go ahead and get started by heading into your course shell. We're gonna to go to your CBM for beginner, Beginners course there. There we go. And uh, we're gonna start by, by building the threaded discussion kind of from the, the big picture point of view. I think there are two ways to approach this in Canvas. One is for those of you who like to pull together all of your resources and, and get kind of the big picture of your course and then deploy like on a chessboard, deploy different pieces as you need them. The second way that I'll show you is the way that I tend to approach it, which is a very linear process starting from the beginning, working all the way through and creating things as you go. But we're going to start with that big picture um, creation piece. So Dr. Larson, what I'm going to have you do is click on discussions there. The discussions area is where you'll find everything related to discussion boards in Canvas. You'll have a full length of, or a full list of your discussions. Uh, discussions can be pinned. So for example, if you had a um, student lounge discussion or a question and answer discussion, you could pin it up to the top so that students can access it all the time. If you have discussions that have been closed for comments, those immediately get moved to the bottom. So as assignments are done, Canvas will automatically move those discussions that are closed. And then active discussions are in that portion in the middle under discussions. So what we see there are the three discussions that are automatically created by Canvas. We're gonna create a new threaded discussion. And I wanna really encourage you, before you begin this technical process of creating a threaded discussion, I want you to think very carefully about what you want your discussion to be about. The technical side is easy. You can create a discussion board in just about any LMS, but coming up with a really good engaging discussion question that requires your students to get to higher order thinking rather than just flatly responding to a question in one or two sentences can be a little bit more difficult. So put that time and thought ahead of time into your discussion board. So let's create a new discussion, Dr. Larson. Uh, go back up to the top of the discussions area. And like we see all the time in Canvas, we've got an icon that's got a plus sign for when we wanna create something new. And in this case, it's plus discussion. So we're going to go ahead and hit the plus discussion button to create a new discussion board. So in the discussion board, the first thing that you want is a title for the discussion topic. This is important because it's the first thing that students are going to see and it's also the title that will show up when you deploy this in modules. So we want a descriptive discussion. Um, if a discussion is embedded in a week, I also like to reference that week or that unit in the discussion. So uh, I often will go something like you know, week two discussion and then a colon and then the title of the discussion. That helps students visually stay organized within the modules there. And what, what would be, there we go, a good title for the discussion here. And then in the box below, the text box below, that's where we're actually going to put the instructions for the discussion and the discussion prompt. Now, what I tend to do is nest the discussion prompt within, within the instructions. I think it's really important to provide instructions to students at the point that they're doing the assignment. So sure, we probably had a module that explained how we were going to do discussions or we talked about it in a different video in our course but we want to give a little reminder of students as to what's expected of them. So I often will put in kind of a standard discussion header and say something like in this week's discussion, please respond or here, you know, please respond to the prompt. Exactly. There we go. So whatever, the, whatever works for you, but something that's going to be standard um, 
before all of the discussions, I think it's important to provide it in every discussion because, and I'm sure we've never seen this before, but students do sometimes forget what they're supposed to do. And so it's good to give them those those reminders. That what's interesting is, and I'm I'm not disagreeing, but I always I tend to put that at the bottom. Um, yeah, I'll put my prompts, whatever the focus of the discussion is, at the top, and then down below. And and in some classes, I actually highlight it, and I'll make the text a little smaller, because we're all. And here's the best practice, guys. It should be consistent. Whatever you do, uh, I know we know this, but whatever you're doing with something that's an ongoing assignment, like a journal, like a threaded discussion, not a you know just this one week or something. I always there's a rubric. You can refer back to the rubric. I put the reminder at the bottom, just as a kind of oh, and before you go. You already know this, blah blah blah. But I'm going to remind you, and then I always and then I put the content at the top. So either one, there's no such thing as the one right way. It's up to you. And Dr. Larson, this is your course, so you do what you do. Your voodoo, you do you, my friend. I think it is a really good uh, good best practice, regardless of whether it's at the top or the bottom, to make it bold, to change the color, to make it italic. Do something to make it stand out as separate from the prompt itself to draw the student's attention to it, Dang. as uh, as Dr. Green mentioned. Excellent. Good. So then we would want to put our discussion prompt in here. Uh, and again, you want to think carefully about a prompt that's going to encourage discussion to help students get to higher order thinking, not just you know um, remembering, not just reciting things from a textbook, but actually to get into some type of analytical or critical thought. Um, really delving deeply and creating the type of discussion where students can respond to each other, maybe with differences of opinion, differences of perspective, uh, or my favorite, with different experiences, so mm -hmm. that they can share the experiences that relate to those topics in the in the discussion itself. Another way to think about this is to relate it back to what we did in six oh nine, the seminar in curriculum design which everybody in this class has taken. Uh, when we talk about those essential questions, if any question can be answered directly with a single fact without having to build on it, it's not rich enough to have a discussion. It's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking about these threaded discussions as uh, it's a bulletin board. I post my question and then everybody just tacks on their answer and then you find somebody else you can go, oh yeah, I agree, blah, blah, blah. That's not what these are. This tool is about getting into authentic conversation. So it's dialectic dialogue. It's learning through the act of negotiating meaning, conversation. This is what I'm thinking. Well, is it really what I'm thinking? So from a constructive v vist v v Vygotsky, constructionism, constructive v v language is our greatest learning tool. These are opportunities for each individual to be engaged in the process of creating understanding because of the work to do these communications. Another way of thinking about this is threaded discussions are not simply to make sure people are doing the reading, watching the videos. It's not just to make sure they're doing the content. It's to give them opportunities to meaningfully use your content. Does that make sense, Michael? Did I explain that? Does that make sense? I, I I think that's excellent. I think that I think that too often we think about threaded discussions as just a a static place to post information rather than a live even if it's asynchronous, a live dialogical conversation. I think that you're, you're I, I chuckled with your dialogical dialogue because that's exactly what a discussion should be encouraging. Cool. So let's look at what you've got here, Dr. Larson. 
Uh, CBM data is useful for tracking progress on students' IEP goals. However, since CBM data is collected regularly, it can also be used to inform your daily instruction. How do you envision using CBM data to inform your instruction? What benefits, drawbacks do you see with using CBM data this way? Okay, so now let me ask you a couple questions, Dr. Larson. For the week that this is taking place in, or, or the focus of this, um, are they, are they actually collecting data? Are they looking at content related to collecting data? What's kind of the context in which this conversation is taking place? So they've had their introduction to CBM, <clears throat> and they've started to look at how they will um, collect data, the various ways that CBM data can be collected for all the different subject areas like reading, writing, math, spelling, um, and so they'll have that background information about what CBM data is and how it can be collected. And so this is kind of the next step into thinking about how CBM data can be used. Cool. Uh, I have a question. Do we have any sample data that they could examine, explore, kind of play with? Sure. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of examples that are available. Okay. So could we or maybe this is for, and guys, this is the conversations that we all have. Again, what, what we're doing right here, this is the very work that you should be doing either with a critical friend or, you know, sit down and have this conversation with yourself. Um, is there an opportunity either here or maybe somewhere else around here to ask them about how they could use the sample data or... To, to give a little bit more specificity before we move into this kind of abstract? Well, I would say that maybe um, <clears throat> because I want them to reflect on their own practice. Mm -hmm. And if I give them sample data, it's not really, they don't have a context for that, how that data was collected, you know, the student, the student's needs. And so I really want them to be thinking about um, how they would apply this in their own classroom. So sample data wouldn't necessarily give them the context to be able to answer this question. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So let me ask you, so let this stand as it is, but that issue of playing with the sample data, could there be in the same week, so there's a, a more direct context, even a video of you uh, showing them, walking them through that sample data and giving specific examples. This could be an I, this could inform me that I could try this or as the teacher I might consider this. And if you had something like that, then you could refer back to it here and say, just as how you saw me thinking through how I could use, if I were the teacher, that sample data to inform my daily instruction, now reflect on your own and do that same kind of cognitive work in your own environment so that this is exactly what you're still looking for and trying to get them to do. And that reflection is so important. But to give them a little more direct context, since it is an, async, since it is an online course and you're not going to have that one-on-one -on -one time to make sure that they're really making that connection yet? Sure. Yeah, that would definitely be something you could build into the class. Awesome. Thank you. So, guys, recognize what we just did there. It's net like uh, we've talked about this before. When you're designing your courses, it's never a linear process because you always have to think contextually. It's not just a race to get to the signature assignment at the end or whatever your grand summative assessment is. So particularly when it's a threaded conversation, because there's a lot of freedom here. And you want to ensure that this opportunity to build your own understanding, that it, it re, even though there's all that freedom, you've got to have that structure. So the very thing that Dr. Larson and I just discussed that little thing she's going to do on the side, make whether it's a video or some kind of other specific guided exploration where she's going to role model 
using data to make decisions, that will inform the students to be that much more reflective and mindful in this conversation, which will make this that much more personally meaningful. So, okay, I'm going to step back, said my piece. You guys get back to building. <laughs> I think that that was actually you know, really helpful to think about the context of this discussion, too. One of the drawbacks to doing videos like this is that we don't have as much time to really talk about the context of the course that that uh, this discussion is in. So I think that that's, that's really helpful. I think that it's also helpful to think about what types of instructions have been given uh, to students and what types of rubrics are being used to assess their work in this discussion board too. So many of you probably noticed that Dr. Larson gave some instructions um, about responding to classmates on different days by Sunday up at the top. We want to also think about how that's being modeled earlier on in the class um, and how discussion board participation and expectations have been set for students throughout the class too. So, Dr. Larson, do you typically have students um, reference course materials in the discussions? Um, have citations outside research or resources? What what types of things do you normally require? Um, I do like students to. I do require students actually to reference um, either course materials or other relevant outside resources, and that's in the scoring rubric for the discussion board. So, I don't. When I put my little reminders um, in the actual prompt, I don't go through all the requirements on the rubric. This is just reminding them that, you know, they have to get into the discussion board by Wednesday, which is something I started doing a really long time ago because I found that if I didn't, everyone waited until Sunday to do their postings, and then it wasn't really a discussion. It was just everybody, you know, popping stuff in there at the last minute to get it done by, by midnight so it wasn't late. So started requiring the initial prompt by Wednesday and then um, um, saw Dr. Green actually asking her students in another class to post on different days so that again students were accessing that discussion board multiple times during the week to make it a, a true discussion. But yeah, the, the scoring rubric that we use for, that I use for the discussion board does require them to um, reflect deeply and critically and to bring in um, and reference appropriately outside resources or course materials. Excellent, excellent. And I think that that's that requiring uh, ongoing participation and engagement is really important. Even in a blended class, these discussion boards are an extension of the learning environment uh, in a face-to-face -face classroom. And in an online class, they are the learning environment. And so really encouraging that type of engagement and participation so that it's not just a, a single spurt of engagement, but rather it's actually meaningful and spread out over, over time by requiring an early post on Wednesday and then multiple points of engagement up until Sunday. I think that that's, that's a, you know, an excellent best practice to, to get students involved. Good. So um, let's scroll down and look at some of the other options here in creating the discussion. So the post to option is if you had multiple sections of the class. And in this case, we only have one section. But if we had multiple sections of the class set up so that uh, students were grouped in a certain way, or if you were combining sections, that would be there. By default, all sections is where, where you want it to be. If you wanted to include some kind of an attachment, that option is there. One of the things, though, that I really want to draw your attention to, and for the life of me, I have not figured out why this is not set by default, but you need to make sure to check that top option to allow threaded replies. For some reason, Canvas does not, by default, allow discussions to be threaded, and so students can't respond to one another unless you post that allow threaded replies. Uh, so make sure you've got that one checked. The second option, students or users must post before seeing replies. This de is really depending on how, how you want to set your class up. Um, some people like to have it set up so that the, the user or the student needs to post their main response before they can respond to other classmates. Some people uh, like to allow their students to read through the discussion, reflect, and then post their main response. That's really kind of a, a preference there. Enabling a podcast feed, if you're using podcasts in your class, that's not something we're going to get into much, but it is definitely an interesting and exciting advanced feature that Canvas has available. We also want to check the box for graded. If we don't check that box for graded, you won't have a discussion board item in your gradebook to show that the students uh, are being graded there. 
Okay. You also have the option uh, to allow liking for students. I think that that's something that's interesting to play with if you wanted to set up and allow students to like individual posts, kind of like we do in Facebook or on Instagram. You can certainly do that. In my experience, I have not, I've, I've been able to get students to do it for maybe one to two discussions, but eventually it sort of peters out. So unless there are points attached to liking uh, posts, I think it's hard to get students to continue to participate. Group discussions, if you had groups set up in your class, and then you want to assign the number of points possible uh, for the discussion and in the gradebook. So how many points do you typically have for a discussion, Dr. Larson? Um, it depends on the course, um, anywhere from 15 or 20 points. So go ahead and assign, assign a point value in there. And then the display grade as option, uh, whether it's points or got incomplete and complete letter grade GPA. I typically stick with points because it's kind of the easiest to be consistent, but that's again your preferences. And then if you're using assignment groups, then that needs to be there under assignments. Peer reviewing of discussions is something that uh, Canvas allows as well, and that's something I would encourage you to spend some time exploring. Uh, we won't get into that in this class. And then as with every assignment that's in Canvas, you've got the assignment options here. So we're going to assign to everyone. Let's go ahead and create a due date for the assignment. So due dates, uh, you can hit yep, the little calendar button there and then go ahead and pick whichever due date you would like uh, for your, your discussion. Now this due date needs to be for the end of the discussion. So as everyone sees, Dr. Larson made it for a Sunday there. And in her discussion instruction, she said that all posts needed to be in by Sunday. One drawback to using due dates in this and in other LMSs is that it only gives students the final due date in the course calendar for the discussion, not the uh, earlier due date of Wednesday for initial participation. So make sure you've made clear to students what that, what that expectation is there. And then availability. If you want the discussion to lock or no longer be available uh, at a certain date, you would set the availability there. The due date just flags for you when there are late posts. And then we want to go ahead and hit the save and publish button down there on the bottom. So save will save your work, but it won't make the discussion board available. Save and publish will make it available. So here we see our completed discussion. It has the instructions up above. It shows that it is a graded discussion with 15 points possible and the due date for that discussion there. You can change the discussion information um, by clicking the edit button up on the top. And one last thing to look at, let's, let's click on those three dots in the upper right hand corner because that will give us some additional information. So this will allow us to mark items as read, to delete the discussion, but more importantly when we're ready to grade the discussion it will take us into uh, Canvas's speed grader which will show us every student's individual work. And the next one, add rubric. If you have already created a rubric or wish to create one for this discussion, you would use that add rubric option there. And don't forget with add rubric, if you've already built your own, because a lot of us tend to do that, right? We have our base rubrics that we use for threaded discussions, for journals, blah, blah, blah. So you have kind of a base language that you use for these kinds of things. You can copy and paste that in to the rubric template, if you will, that they give you. So you're not reinventing the wheel. Please don't feel like, oh, I have to rebuild every single rubric. No, you, you'll copy and paste. And once you've built one, then it can be uh, pulled into every other threaded conversation so that, let's say you're doing an eight-week course. You're not building a rubric every single week. Once you've got the one built, you just refer back to that one, but it's built into the grade center for you, makes your grading go faster, and for the students, because rubrics give so much more guidance and information. So it's a big win-win. I definitely want to echo that. Don't reinvent the wheel. I also think that it's good to use examples that are out there, rubrics from other people, um, make sure that you're adapting them to make them work and attribute sources, but don't reinvent the wheel. All right, so are we ready to uh, place this discussion board into the modules? Sounds good. Excellent. So let's head over into modules. 
We can just click that there. Our discussion has already been saved and published, so we're in good shape. And let's scroll down into, into one of your modules here for week. Um, let's go down into week two there. So in week two, you've got your uh, CBM and reading. And we're going to go ahead and just press the plus icon to add an item to the module. And from that drop down in the top, we want to pick discussions. And then we'll find the discussion we just created, the week two discussion, CBM data to inform instruction. Perfect. I always like to indent one space uh, for items there to make it a little bit easier to flow. And then click add item. And that discussion then shows up right there in modules. The green check mark tells us that it is published and available to students. And we're ready to move on to the next thing. So that was fairly easy. Before we move on, though, I'd like to take just a second to show you the other way that you can create a discussion directly from modules. So in the last example, we went into the discussions link on the left hand side. In this example, I'm not going to go through the whole process, but I'm going to show you how you start to create a discussion right here from modules. So Dr. Larson, go ahead and press that plus button for me again. So notice here in the discussions, one of the discussions in the list is one in brackets that says new topic. Go ahead and click that new topic for me. Now notice that when you click new topic, we get a blank for topic name and then the indentation off, uh, option down below. We can just type the title of our discussion in here. So if we wanted to do like week two discussion B or something along those lines, and then click add item. Now a placeholder discussion has been placed there under week two. So we've got week two sample discussion. Notice that it does not have the green check mark, which means that it is not yet published or available to students. And that's because we haven't finished creating it yet. So go ahead and click the link for that sample discussion. Just on the week two sample discussion itself. Yep, perfect. Okay, now we have the unpublished discussion and we can click on edit in the upper right hand corner to go through and do all of the things that we just did through the discussion creation. This tends to be the way that I create most of my discussions by going through and inserting them at the point that they're going to be used um, because that's just the way that my brain works. Some people like to go through and create all of their assignments and activities and then go through and place them in the class layout. It just really depends on how you process your design and information. So you would complete this section just as we did the other one and then hit the save and publish down on the bottom and end up with the exact same end result that we had in the earlier discussion. If we go back into modules, we'll see that it is published and ready to go. How did you feel that went, Dr. Larson? Fairly straightforward? It is very straightforward and a, a very user-friendly system. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of this particular video. And again, please, the threaded discussions, you saw how easy it is to actually build them from that mechanistic perspective. It's pretty darn logical. But recognize the amount of time we spent thinking about how to make sure that the conversation that we were creating the environment for, Michael used that term and it's very important creating the environment for a conversation to take place. You saw how, and you heard, uh, how we were talking about, okay, well, what are you really trying to get them to do? Let's be mindful about this. Okay, you want that reflection. It's so important and to personalize it. And then we ended up adding to the context of it with an outside, whether it's going to be a resource or a mini assignment, Dr. Larson, she's not, we haven't decided exactly what she's going to do there, but there will be something that brings better context and better prepares the environment for this conversation to truly be a dialectic dialogue where because you've had that experience to prep you and you see how someone else has played with it, you will then be ready to mindfully play in your own reflection. Well, this is what I'd like. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I could do. We've created the environment for that to make this as rich as it possibly can be for each individual student. 
So with that, um, Michael, would you like to say goodbye to the nice people? Well, I'd like to say goodbye. And I also, as you were talking, I, I thought back to my early days as a baby teacher <laughs> when I got to the first classroom and spent a lot of time thinking about how my classroom would be a reflection of me with maybe some inspirational posters, some Garfield posters, <laughs> making it bright and cheerful and setting up bulletin boards and all of that. And, and essentially, that's what we're thinking about doing here. We're just using that in a different environment. We're just using technology instead of, you know, posters from um, the various teacher stores that are out there. Anyway, that was I was reminiscing momentarily. Goodbye, nice people, and have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs> Dr. Larson, any last words? I just um, appreciate the walkthrough with learning how to build discussions and think about writing good discussion questions. Awesome. All right, everybody, enjoy your enjoy doing your own building and thinking. Thank you.